Firstly, I have to say it's a joy uh, to have Father Micah with us. We were just hanging out in the rectory between masses, and he said, I'm going to come and con celebrate. And to me, that's just a beautiful sign of, of communal prayer. He already did a mass yesterday. He did a mass. He took the early mass this morning, and his desire to just be with us and pray, even when we only need one mass, to, uh, one priest for this mass, again, just a beautiful desire uh, for a community. So that doesn't happen um, with all, in all priestly circumstances, and uh, I just recognize a good thing when I see it. Secondly, we have um, two seminarians. They're not lazy priests that are just kind of sitting over there. Uh, two seminarians, uh, Riley and Brett, they are both uh, from Montana, and they will be with us this year uh, in kind of a gift of mutual exchange. And so uh, they're given to us to help form them on the parochial level. They're studying to be parish priests. It'd be weird if they just were cooped up in the seminary for seven straight years without actually being in a parish. And so this is where the ground level, this is where the theology that they're learning <clears throat> meets real life, as it were, experience. And for them to, to be able to do that synthesis. And so you are part of this formation of them, and then they will be sharing the gifts uh, of their studies with us in various ways. And so we welcome them. I don't know where you were in the 90s, but if you remember those WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? They were kind of intended uh, to help us be able to do an on-the-fly examination of conscience or a moment of deliberation. If I'm in between two choices, what would Jesus do? I don't think the answer to that is he would hate people, as in today's gospel, where Jesus says, if anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. I don't think hatred is a condition for following Jesus or for being his disciple. So let's break that down a little bit because, again, scriptures are very curious. Remember, Jesus would have been preaching, speaking in Aramaic or Hebrew. Aramaic is a derivative of Hebrew. And then this, these words would have sat and settled in the hearts and minds of the apostles, disciples, uh, the one, the three, the twelve, the seventy-two, the horde of crowds, the five thousand, it would have sat with them in Hebrew, and then the scriptures were written in Greek, and then they come to us in English. So it means they're filtered through three different languages. So what's going on here? Hebrew lacks what's called a superlative. Good, better, best. Degrees of intensity in words. In order to say something is the most of something else, they say it three times. That's why in the Mass, we actually use a Hebrew construction for the holy, holy, holy. Literally what we're saying is, Lord, you are the holiest thing possible, but we say it the Hebrew way, holy, holy, holy. If we said holy, holy, we'd be saying, you are holier than other things. If we just said holy, then we're naming an attribute of God. So when we say holy, 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 we're claiming that God is the holiest thing in existence. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh in the Hebrew. And so again, sometimes things filter through languages in a beautiful way, in a clunky way, and study allows us to crack open what's the truth that that language brings out in a very particular way, in a very beautiful way. And so what's going on here? Jesus says, unless you hate others, again, I don't think we're talking about psychological mental hatred. I don't think Jesus is asking us to harbor hatred, bitterness, anger, resentment as a condition of following him. When I was in college, I uh, was in the dorms, and there was this very beautiful girl. Her name was Brienne, and we started going uh, to Mass together at St. Thomas Aquinas on the Hill. And then we'd sit next to each other, and we definitely had kind of the flirtatiousness thing going on. And then the sign of peace becomes the sign of peace becomes the sign of peace. And just as I'm about to ask her out on a date, she one day says, I'm thinking about being a nun. 
To which I respond, I'm thinking about being a priest. Which is the worst pickup line in the world. <laughs> so we both go on a discernment retreat to say, Lord, what do you want for my life? What do you desire for the trajectory of my life? She went with the Nashville Dominicans and received a very clear no from God that you are called to holy matrimony, to marriage. I sat there in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. I was like, Lord, here I am. I'm waiting for my no so I could go date Brian in peace and have things my way. Whenever you want to say that no, Lord, here I am. I'm totally open. But instead, the Lord spoke to the ears of my heart in a way that he's only ever done twice in my life. And he said, Daniel, don't you realize that I want your happiness for you more than you want it for yourself? I want your happiness for you more than you want it for yourself. That's all he said. He didn't say, be a priest. He didn't say, go date Brienne. He didn't say anything else other than, I want your happiness for you. One of the things he was communicating to me in so few words is he's trustworthy. I had been running away from him since the eighth grade when the notion of priesthood first came into my heart and said, gosh, no way. I went, after having gone on this discernment retreat, I called up my mom and said, I think the Lord might want me to be a priest. And she said, Daniel, don't throw away your life like that. I said, oh my goodness. If that's what you said, then don't tell my dad. Now again, why do I bring this up? To follow Jesus, we have to prefer his will above all things. If you watched my homily on YouTube from last week, or if you were at the uh, 7.30 or 9 a.m. Masses, then you heard that Satan will never tempt you towards one of two things. He will never tempt you towards humility. And I told a story of at a time when I was a seminarian and I stole a pen from the now defunct old Chicago on Colorado Boulevard and how the Lord actually used that as a moment of grace in my life. So Satan will never tempt us towards humility. He cannot repurpose humility towards his schemes. The other thing Satan can never tempt us towards is obedience. Obedience. In Latin, that means to listen to. To listen to the voice of the Lord. Now, the reason Satan can never do that, and when I say obedience, I'm not meaning 1950s Catholicism, pay, pray, and obey, do whatever we say, and that's it. That's not what I mean by obedience. What I mean by obedience is listening to the voice of the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do? Reinsert the what would Jesus do bracelets. Lord, what would you have me do in this circumstance? And a total openness to the will of God. If you're open to the will of God, Satan can't use that against you. But again, you have to be careful with uh, little 21-year-old Daniel's version of openness to God. Lord, I'm open to you affirming whatever I desire in my heart versus a true openness to God. Lord, here I am. I've come to do your will. And that freedom leads to our ability to be happy. Had I heeded the words of my mom, had I heeded my own preferences, I might be in a very different place right now. When Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother, wife or husband or children or brothers and sisters, or even your own life, even your own preferences, you cannot be my disciple. That hatred is, again, not hatred in our sense of the term. It's a preference for the will of God. If you and I prefer any earthly thing, any earthly person over God, 
we're going to end up unsatisfied. It's basically the creator versus creation. Do we prefer God who is the creator, the designer of our hearts? He knows what they're for. He knows the mission that he's entrusted to each of us specifically that no one else in the entirety of the cosmos can carry out except for you. And having given you very specific gifts and allowed very specific faults in your life, he can work through both to bring about his purposes. If we but come after him, follow him, prefer his will, thus be obedient to the voice of the Lord. So Jesus lays that out as a condition of discipleship. And then he takes what seems like a right-hand turn and then says, which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost? And then he jumps to another metaphor. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king? What is Jesus saying? He's not talking to any kings here present. There are probably very few construction workers present listening to Jesus. So why does Jesus bring it up? It's a spiritual practice of taking inventory of our lives. What is that taking inventory? Well, in the Catholic tradition, the examine prayer, the examination of conscience. So at the end of my day, at the end of my week, to say, Lord, where have I followed you, and where have I not? The taking inventory of our resources and being open to the truth. There's some very good reporting coming out right now about why Russia is not doing as well as they thought they would many months ago. And part of the interesting twist on it all is a breakdown in the upper echelons of the Russian government of a lot of government officials not feeling like they can be honest with Vladimir Putin about their own readiness, about their own resources and ability to fight. Who wants to tell the top dog, no, or I don't think this is a good idea, or give any kind of honest pushback? And in a land where that honesty spoken to power is not met well, now you see the degradation of the military forces at play. If Vladimir Putin is not open to the truth of the weaknesses of his own country or government or whatever, then whenever he launches a campaign first in his mind and then seeks to execute it in reality, in reality, if he's not open to the truth of reality, it will fall short. Thus, so too with each of us. When we learn to take spiritual inventory of our lives, we have to be open to the truth. Lord, what in my life needs to change if I'm going to follow after you, if I'm going to prefer you to me, you to my schedule, you to my Tesla, whatever it is, you, the creator, to anything or anyone else that is created and therefore finite. You, the creator, that in the eve of my life and the last breath leaves my lungs, everything else will fall away. And darkness will come upon my soul as I enter into death. And yet you, the singular light of Christ, represented in the baptismal candle that we hold up every Easter as a sign of the resurrection, that you, the creator, have the ability to do something about my death. Give me eternal life. And thus, the way that I live, I take inventory of how I live. And where I don't live in accord with your desires, where I prefer it my way, then I need to come to grips with that. Because at the end of my life, I'm not going to have it my way. I only have it your way or no way at all. After these two metaphors, then Jesus adds a little cherry on top. 
In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. What I don't think Jesus is saying is that we need to just strip off our clothes, live in loincloths, sit on the dirt, and become hippies. Renounce of possessions, the renunciation of possessions, is the renunciation of the power of created things over our own lives. That it is possible for us to prefer created things. So whether you love Sunny D or golf or your television, or whatever it is, you need to make sure that you love God more. And if you don't know how to, if you don't know what it means to be in a loving relationship with God, come shake one of our hands, Father, Micah, and myself, and just say, I need help. Come shoot us an email. We'd love to walk with you. We gave our lives for this. We met Jesus Christ, incarnate love of God. He changed our lives and sent us to bring him to others. This is the beauty of the freedom of the children of God, to be able to prefer his will over all things. I never thought I could be this happy being a priest. I never thought that my life would be as blessed as it is. Now, I have many sufferings in my life, especially as a pastor, and at the same time, it is so upheld by God and the true community of those whom he has given me and Father Micah here, that he has blessed it and allowed me to trust that he truly does prefer my happiness for me more than I desire it for myself. And therefore, God is trustworthy over and above my will, over and above my family, over and above the sense of control I think I have over my life, God is faithful. And in every age of my life, he has been a refuge. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God. Now let's call a spade a spade for a half second and say, most of us probably have our act together. We're probably financially stable in kind of the middle class of America. We don't have like the common struggles that we read about in other sections of the world or the state. Thus, Letting Jesus in is going to be scary. When you and I live in a world of Amazon two-day shipping, Teslas coming out in droves, when we live in a world that can allow us to be comfortable and give us a false sense of security, at least material security, it can ill-prepare us for death. It can ill prepare us for other things that are larger than material things alone can take care of. And yet letting Jesus in is the most freeing thing possible. Now be careful because he'll mess everything up from our point of view. But he will rearrange it in such a way that you and I are not encumbered by our possessions. They will no longer possess us. One of the things that I hold close to my heart every day is my iPhone. It sits in my breast pocket right over my heart. And I love my iPhone. I've had one since 2009, and the iPhone 14 comes out this Wednesday. And you better believe I'm going to be all over that. I love the iPhone. I love all things Apple. Because for me, they're the best communication devices and communication is a form of love. However, every year I go on an annual retreat and I sit there and say, I need to make sure that this year, if Apple becomes super corrupt, if they do something really intense, if they start going after Christians or or whatever, I need to be able to walk away from Apple. 
so that nothing, I prefer nothing, including Apple, over Jesus. That's something that just knowing me, that I need, I know that I need to do that. In our rectory, Father Micah and I have a, a chapel where it's kind of like our battle station. And three days a week, we pray a holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament. We pray for you, the parish. We pray for our staff, for everyone that comes onto our campus. So we have that tabernacle as like an inner sanctum. And then by it, I have a shrine of iPhones. It's all the iPhones from the original one until at least the iPhone 10. Because again, we can become very attached to things. And if you take an inventory, if you're open and honest to the things of your life, there are things in each of our lives that can get away, that can get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. We can prefer sleeping in to coming to Mass. Or I go to Mass most of the time, but not when I'm on vacation, not Labor Day weekend although clearly you don't need to hear that right now. But the Lord gives us the graces that we need to prefer Him in everything. And then in preferring Him, He gives us the freedom to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And when we have that down, He all the more increases our ability to love our neighbor as ourself. Because when we love God in His proper place, He reveals so much about who we are. And then it corrects our ability to actually love ourself. And then it goes into those around us, including those who make our life difficult, our modern-day enemies, and those who are very annoying. And then in loving them, we are so transformed. This is the work of the Lord at every Mass. This is the work of the Lord when we approach Him in prayer and say, Lord, I need help. And oh, what a beautiful way coming after the Lord, following the Lord, is. Lastly, we have two hungry seminarians. If you would like to take them out to brunch, they would love it. You can preach to them. You can tell them everything that's wrong with the church and how they should fix it. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Be with May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.